hello welcome queer fam apologies for the tiny little technical hitch there uh, uh, we had a few little issues but it's all good we're live we're here a few minutes late but i promise you it's going to be worth the wait uh, my name is Tui Lyon. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I am your host for tonight. Welcome to your Thursday joy of queerness. Uh, it's entertainment time. I am thrilled to be with you all this evening. So excited to be bringing you this absolutely jam-packed show full of queer goodness. Uh, we have so much on the show tonight. It's going to be incredible. Uh, of course, we have the very, very fabulous Alok on the program later. They are most definitely the most wonderfully styled activists you've ever seen. Uh, we will be chatting to them about their brand new book, Beyond the Gender Binary. So I'm really excited to have them on the show and get into lots of wonderful nitty gritty about that amazing publication. We also have, uh, of course, our resident beverage director, Miss Megan Graham. She's going to be pumping out not one, but two delicious fruity cocktails for you at the end of the night for cheers to you. Uh, for our center focus segment tonight, we will be taking a little look back at the history of the center. So this incredible organization has been around over 50 years. And on our 50th year, which was last year, we did an incredible look back over the center's history and beginnings and breadth of services and sort of journey over those 50 years. So we're going to be taking you on a little walk down memory lane for that. Of course, we have our pet parade. It wouldn't be entertainment without our pet parade. This week, we've got pride pets happening. So it's especially rainbowy and adorable as if our show isn't full of rainbows and glitter enough. There's going to be a little bit more in the pet parade. So you're welcome. Um, of course, uh, so much more. We've got our queer quiz going on. Uh, we actually have uh, some beautiful little queer love stories that we're going to be bringing to you tonight. Um, now, tonight actually is our last episode of Centertainment. Oh, I know. What are you going to do with your Thursdays? I don't, I don't know either. But uh, we have so many more things here at the Los Angeles LGBT Center coming at you. So there'll be fantastic more virtual options to engage with us. We have Trans Pride coming up. That's going to be virtual and happening in June. So much fun stuff is on the horizon. So we will be focusing our efforts there. But we want to thank you for tuning in to all these entertainment episodes that I know you've all loved so much. Now, of course, usually we're doing physical events. Usually we're out there fundraising every day, working on different uh, events that our community can come to and engage. Right now, virtual is our platform uh, and we are fundraising tonight. The center services are supported entirely by uh, many revenue streams, but one big of one of, of them is donations. If you are able to give tonight, um, please give generously. The information's on the bottom of your screen there. Um, so follow those links and please support um, the center. All of the donations go towards our care fund which is our COVID-19 relief fund. So that is supporting us financially to pivot and change the way we deliver our service. So we can keep giving healthcare, we can keep giving mental health support, we can keep giving housing, food insecurity support to the wonderful queer community of Los Angeles. So please donate if you can. Now, first up on the program, we have the incredible Anthony from a beautiful floral company called The Boy Who Cried Flowers. Now, The Boy Who Cried Flowers uh, create all kinds of absolutely stunning floral arrangements. And we thought for center stage this week, usually, of course, we're bringing you a, perform a musical performance or a dance performance, something like that, or some poetry. We already have some excellent poetry on the show later with Alok, so uh, I thought I would mix it up this week and give you a live floral arrangement. Make sure you follow uh, him on socials. His details will be up on his video, but we want to welcome to the program the boy who cried flowers for Center Stage. Tuning in, this is Anthony with The Boy Who Cried Flowers. I am partial owner and founder of The Boy Who Cried Flowers. We are a flower firm here in Southern California, and I want to thank you for tuning in and watching our video with Sensertainment today. 
I'm gonna be using a lot of principles of design today. I'm gonna to be using some of my uh, traditional color palettes that I like to use. I'm also gonna be doing something that's true to my style. And I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I enjoy creating this. For me, flowers started as a way to express creativity and fortunately has turned into my career. Um, I'm so fortunate that I have this as a career because I get to give the gift of happiness to people. I've chosen a color palette today that I think will reflect happiness and uh, bring forth some inspiration and uh, something that's really fun for everyone to look at and I hope that with watching this you're inspired to pick up some blooms yourself and create some magic. We'd love to see what you make so tag us at The Boy Who Cried Flowers. absolutely love their work so make sure you check them out on socials at the boy who cried flowers and website by the same name as well so check them out give them a follow remember everybody who's on the program tonight is donating their time uh, to support the center so if you can uh, make a donation tonight follow them on social media support all of our guests because they are supporting us and we love to give back to our beautiful queer fam now next up uh, we have our center focus segment and center focus is where we like to bring you a little bit of center news or information about our services and programs as i said in our intro of course tonight we are taking a look back over the history of the center it is a pretty amazing and glorious history so we felt for our last episode of Centertainment, it felt particularly fitting that we share with you the last 50 years of the los angeles lgbt center so please enjoy this week's center focused The Los Angeles LGBT Center saved my life, and it's quite possible that it could save yours too. My life at the beginning was about surviving. Now it's about dreaming big. The center gave me the freedom and the opportunity to dream big. A lot of people in our community don't have a sense of belonging or welcoming, and the center provides that. I feel safer, I feel more comfortable, I feel like there's always somewhere to go. They helped us when we didn't have hope. We say thank you. When I see what has happened here, and uh, there's hope for everyone. By the end of 1969, the post-Black Cat and Stonewall world is fostering a new ideal, liberation. Radical, direct action breaks the chains of shame, giving way to pride and purpose. In Los Angeles, members of the Gay Liberation Front are determined to go into the next evolution. They begin offering services and support focused on the needs of the emerging community. In 1971, with $35 in the bank, the all-volunteer organization opens its first headquarters with a sign for all to see. The founders have big ideas for their new home. We are determined to go into the next evolution, the business of revolution by example. Founding board member, Morris Kite. It's a revolutionary concept that is still part of the center's DNA. That's what we were about in gay liberation was we didn't want to be accepted. We wanted to change the world for ourselves and for everyone. They had to look um, some hate in the face that I have the privilege of not having to and that they were very uh, bold in their message for what they wanted, not just for themselves, but for the future. They're the ones that let us know that we don't need to be in the shadows. I'm watching them. Someone younger than me is watching me. To be able to dream is a revolution. By 1972, nearly 6,000 people are accessing services. As we developed and grew, so did the concept, and so did our services. Founding board member, June Hurley. Six liberation houses offer room and board for $1.50 a day. 
the world's first lesbian health clinic is open. After years of tangling with the IRS, the center becomes the first LGBT organization to receive tax-exempt status. It comes with the conditions that we cannot advocate the practice of or contend that homosexuality is normal, conditions we promptly ignore. On the heels of our IRS designation, the center becomes the first LGBT organization ever to receive federal funding. By 1975, we've grown into our new headquarters on Highland Avenue. And a new name reflects our evolving identity, even as our next great challenge silently develops in the shadows. Scientists at the National Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta today released the results of a study which shows that the lifestyle of some male homosexuals has triggered an epidemic of a rare form of cancer. Little by little, we were watching the, the community disappear. We lost millions of um, men and women that were heroes and sheroes and queeros, that were revolutionists, that were activists and anarchists and artists and teachers and uh, trailblazers. The center's early response to the epidemic focuses on care and compassion. An emergency hotline is set up to answer questions from the community. The LA Cares Like a Mother campaign gets national attention. The center opens the first HIV testing site in California and quickly becomes the nation's largest. We are literally in a fight for our lives. Mr. President, have any reaction to the announcement of the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta that AIDS is now an epidemic? It's known as gay plague. <laughs> no, it is. I mean, it's a pretty serious thing that uh, one in every three people that get this have died, and I wonder if the president is aware of it. I don't have it. Are you? Do you? You don't have it. Well, I'm relieved to hear that. Larry. I, I do you? No, you, I don't. you didn't answer my question. Well, I just wondered, How do you know? Does the president, in other words, the White House looks on this as a great joke? Terrible way to learn political education and a terrible way to learn your own power. It just it angered me. It made me really angry. And um, I decided that I wasn't just going to just stand by. And, um, and just be a victim or let, let people kick me around. I was going to get out and I was going to fight. With our government's criminal indifference to the epidemic, caring for our community becomes an act of political warfare. And we continue the commitment to our revolution by example, vowing to build what no one else dares to even dream. We launched the first capital campaign in history by an LGBT organization to remodel what will become our new headquarters. Ironically, it's the former IRS office, the same building where our nonprofit tax status was denied back in the 1970s. We dream bigger, and in 1994 hit the road to end AIDS. Known as AIDS Life Cycle since 2001, the ride has raised more than $280 million. By the mid-90s, our revolution by example is booming as we continue to care for and celebrate our community. We cap the decade in 1998 when we open the village at Ed Gould Plaza, a $7 million community education and cultural center. A place like this with the, with the resources and the community and just the sense of dignity and, and respect um, afforded to a lot of individuals who are often in really vulnerable places. It allows me the opportunity to to be me. I didn't go to my senior prom when I was in high school. I didn't go because I didn't want to wear a gown. I just, I was like, this isn't me. You know, I want to wear the tuxedo. And so now when I go, I can wear my tuxedo. And I love that. As we enter the new millennium, our revolution by example is serving more LGBT people than any other organization in the world. Our mission is to build a world where LGBT people thrive as healthy, equal, and complete members of society. From housing for youth and seniors to caring for our LGBT veterans and transgender community and providing the health care we all deserve. From your local school campus to China's Great Wall and all points in between, we're building that world one revolution at a time. Still, the 
The political realities of the 80s and 90s teach us that caring for our community must go hand in hand with advocating for change. We declare that HIV is a gay disease so we can own it and one day end it. As the nation elects our most LGBT supportive president in history, we learn that we can never take progress for granted. And we keep fighting until the Supremes put a ring on it. We come to understand that sexual orientation and gender identity rest at the intersection of a host of identities. And our revolution must include them all. We stand together to mourn. We stand together in defiance. We stand together in solidarity. We stand together as we fight like hell. And we stand together when a dream like no other comes true. At a time in our nation when the highest leaders in the land are building a wall to keep the most vulnerable among us out, your center has built a home to invite the most vulnerable in. The center is inspiring. The center is a safe space for us to be ourselves. El centro de mi corazón. The center is amazing. Magnificent. A haven. Home. My home. It's like coming home. Like this big with open arms. Beacon of light for LGBTQ people. The center is the world for me. This is the only place on earth to be. It's your center. The center means that people who feel like they have nowhere to go have somewhere to go. No matter what. Welcome to the Revolution by Example. 50 years and counting. such an incredible piece it's just so amazing to be able to take a a full look at the center's history over the last 50 years some of those words get me every time it's beautiful thank you so much to our marketing and communications team for putting that incredible video together uh, and i'm so glad that we got to share it with you tonight uh, now, it's really important. I think that video perfectly illustrates exactly why it's so important to support your center um, because we have, we've traveled a long road and we are still here during these pandemic times fighting for the rights of LGBTQ people and supporting your everyday lives in Los Angeles. So um, please give if you can. Um, donate information is on your bottom of your screen there. Now, next up, uh, we are pivoting uh, to a lighter moment. We have our pet parade coming up. Now, this week's theme, as you chose last week, is pride themed. Uh, we're hitting pride month early and I absolutely love it. I'm always down for to drown everything in rainbows. Uh, so I hope you all enjoy all these fabulous furry friends in here uh, and this week's pet parade. the cutest 
so adorable. Um, now coming up next, we have our queer quiz. But before that, I want to plant the seed. We will be taking questions from the chat tonight for our fabulous guest, Alok. So please have a think about what you would like to ask them. Pop it in the chat and our moderators will share it through. Um, so we will be doing a Q&A with them coming up very soon. Uh, got a couple little things before then, uh, but I wanted to get you thinking about what you'd like to ask them in the chat. So please post it in the chat on Facebook or in the chat on Twitch, and we'll take a little look-see before we head into that interview. Uh, coming up next, we have our queer quiz. It is a guess that pride flag. This one is particularly relevant for something that might have happened over the last week or so, but I'll let you all figure that out. Uh, coming up next, queer quiz. How did y'all go? Did you get it? Of course, it was the pansexual pride flag. Uh, that one, of course, is particularly relevant right now because it was Pansexual Visibility Day on May 24th. So we wanted to pop that one in there as it's happened just a few days ago. Um, now, coming up next, we have a little treat for you. Uh, so, of course, we last year was our 50th year. And if you didn't know, uh, we had a fantastic concert at the Greek Theatre um, called Hearts of Gold. And for that program, we had some lots of fantastic queers from all over contribute and help put together that incredible concert and production. Two of those fabulous people are the wonderful Caden and Michael from Little Bull Productions. And they put together, uh, in the style of When Harry Met Sally, they put together a number of super adorable little uh, stories of queer love and friendship and relationships. And we thought right now, what does everyone need in their life? Probably a little bit more love and happiness. Uh, so we thought we'd spread a little bit of joy uh, by sharing these adorable little videos that they put together. So you're welcome. It was a delightful bar called The Sugar Shack. And it was uh, 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 it's Culver City. And um, it was all professional women going there and they had a band and it was just delightful and there was always a line outside to go in and it was just very very nice and a few of the guys used to stop by you know and um, that was where um, I met her old girlfriend and we were sitting talking and then she asked me how I felt about like interracial affairs and things I said well I don't care <laughs> and I don't you, know, <laughs> yeah. you said long as she's you said something nice, Joycey. I did? Yeah. You oh. Told, you told me, she said, you said, long as she's nice and pretty. Yeah, I did, I that. did. <laughs> and there I was, in 1993, signing up to do the AIDS ride. And it was great. I had fun. I involved my family, like my brother Andrew, who came along. <laughs> so long ago. It's been yeah. pretty amazing, actually, um, to be here with my sister and to do the roadie for the first time. Um, this is something that I will continue for years to come. So, so we met, and he wasn't even interested in me, and which is fine because I didn't know he existed at the time. Um, but it wasn't until several months later we started to talk and um, get to know each other um, and then eventually started dating and that was over 10 years ago. I walked you home and then 
you said, well, let me walk you home. And I said, well, we were just there, so <laughs> let's meet halfway. So we met halfway and we stood in the middle of the street at four or five or six, whatever morning, it was yeah. in the morning. And then when it was time to say goodbye, you leaned over to me and I thought it was going to be one thing. And then you punched me in the arm and I, said, good night. I was young and awkward and stupid. And then we <laughs> ran off in our opposite directions. And then I stopped dead in my tracks and I said, I can't can't let this pass and so I ran chased him down and uh, I said okay uh, um, I was out of breath and I said hey, would you mind if I kiss you good night and before he could say no I kissed him and uh, and then someone came around the corner and we got scared and ran away um, like, and then 18 years later we're still together and we've been married for four years yeah Weren't they such beautiful stories? A uh, little bit of queer joy for your Thursday night. Um, now coming up next, we have our conversation with the incredible Alok. Please pop your questions in the chat if you have some questions for them. We will be shooting those at them later in the conversation. Now if you're not familiar, Alok is a gender non-conforming writer and performance artist. Their distinctive style and poetic challenge to the gender binary is internationally renowned. Uh, they have presented work in over 500 countries, uh, 500 venues and over 40 countries. Um, they are the author of Femme in Public and their brand new book, Beyond the Gender Binary. Uh, we're going to be chatting to them about the book tonight. I am super, super excited about it. Um, this next video illustrates a little bit about their work and shares a beautiful performance from them as well. So pop your questions in the chat and we'll be chatting to them right after this. I've learned that the most important questions don't have answers. They just have more questions and response. And one of the most fundamental questions that I've tried to run into in my life is who am I? I began to realize I was not a boy. I think it took more time to figure out that just because I wasn't a boy meant I didn't have to be a girl. My name is Alok. I'm a writer and performance artist. I'm trying to challenge a world that isolates us from one another and prevents us from talking about the things that are most important to us in public. When I was a little kid, I lived life on my own terms. I utterly hated boys' clothes and the expectations that were assigned to me as someone supposed to being a boy. I was taught that so many parts of myself were incompatible, that I wasn't allowed to be free, and that was called masculinity. I try to flip the script in that question and say, when did my joy become too much for the society? When did my creativity have to be policed into the binary? I'm actually fighting for a world where all people are able to self-determine their gender. What I want to challenge the gender binary, not man and woman. I want man and woman to be two of millions. I want man and woman to be able to exist without having to be in tension or in opposition. I want people to be able to say I'm a woman and for that not necessarily to mean and therefore I'm not masculine and I'm not a man. I want people to be able to say I'm a man and for that not to mean therefore I'm not a woman or not feminine. You contain multitudes. And I think that what we should be doing is just surrendering to the complexity of ourselves and other people. I make art because people are looking at me, but they're often not listening to me. People are looking at me, but people aren't actually thinking about what it would be like to be me. And I feel like when it comes to the trans community, we're so often looked at, but so rarely regarded, as if everything that we do is about our genders, as if I walk around and I think about gender every single moment of my day. <laughs> to be honest, I'm kind of bored of the current conversation, giving visibility to marginalized people, as if visibility is what we were asking for. What we were asking for is a recognition of our dignity. Visibility takes this kind of dangerous currency in our community. People require us to be visible, otherwise they misgender us. But then when we are visible, we get attacked and there's no resources for us. What I want is more ambitious 
and more complete than visibility. What I want is a total and fundamental shift in perspective that doesn't require us to be visible to be seen. When you're falling down, you try to grab for something to not hit the ground. And I grabbed and I found the stage and I grabbed and I found the pen. Poetry is the way that I live my life. The thing about a poem is that you're less interested in being rational as you are in being sentimental. Today I realized how similar diaspora and dysphoria look on a page. We've always been made to feel foreign in our own bodies, a guest overstaying welcome, a resident of a place we are constantly reminded we don't belong to. Isn't diaspora its own form of dysphoria? Asking for gender is another way of asking, where did you come from? Sometimes when I answer, water comes out. I don't know what my gender is. I don't know where I'm from. What happened? Alok, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, we're so, so thrilled to have you. Um, as I was I said before in your introduction, I admire you for a number of reasons, but having someone on the show who's so fabulously styled all the time is definitely close to my heart. So <laughs> stoked to have you here. I'm actually so excited about this shirt because it's, it's like <gasps> Adam and Eve, but Eve and the garden having like fun times with vegetables. Ooh. That's <laughs> fantastic. I love it. It's so great. Excellent. Well, Alok, uh, tell us about your fantastic new book, Beyond the Gender Binary. What yeah. what can folks expect when they when they pick up a copy of that? I'm actually sinking into the cover right now. That's my background. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's my book here, and it's called Beyond the Gender Binary. And basically, I created it as a handbook to respond to the rise of anti-trans legislation and discrimination that's unfortunately mm -hmm. happening all across the country. So it's divided into two parts. The first part is a little bit about my story and growing up in Texas. And the second part is kind of outlining the arguments that are used against trans and gender non-conforming people with responses that we can use to have rebuttals against them. Fantastic. So you're giving people some really tangible tools to meet those challenges that folks are coming across every day. So true. I feel like a lot of cis people want to support trans and gender non-conforming people. They just don't know what to say. And so I wanted mm -hmm. to create a book that could be kind of a handbook that you could give to people to be like, hey, here, you don't have to like interrogate me about my life. You can learn here and actually be a better person and advocate for me. Absolutely. The internet is also a wonderful tool for those people as well, but hopefully this gorgeous little book will be even more incentive for them to educate themselves. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so you're in the middle of a fantastic campaign to donate 5,000 copies of this book to LGBTQ youth across America. Uh, the campaign's running until June 9th. Uh, tell me about this incredible undertaking. Sure. So unfortunately, all of my book touring had to be canceled during the pandemic. And what my original plan was, was to go to states that are being targeted by anti-LGBTQ legislation and partner up with local organizations to raise the visibility of these laws to help vulnerable members of our community. So the Trevor Project recently released a statistic that 73% of LGBTQ young people have their mental health impacted by the political situation, especially by anti-LGBTQ legislation. And so unfortunately in 2020, we have over 20 states that are targeting trans young people with legislation, which is so unacceptable because this community is already experiencing bullying at schools, bullying at home, and now bullying from the government. It's just overwhelming. So I've partnered up with community organizations across the country in almost every single state from Alabama to Wyoming to distribute these books to young LGBTQ people, both as a form of validation during Pride, but also as a way to give them the tools and the language to respond to this rise of discrimination. Yeah, I know you have generously donated 50 incredible copies of this book to our Children, Youth and Family Services Department. So thank you. <laughs> we will be handing those out during Pride Month to all those beautiful young queers that come through our doors um, looking for support. So I think it's going to be such a fantastic resource. I think we're incredibly blessed to be in Los Angeles and have the res a resource like the Centre and so many states, like you mentioned, just don't have access and have those they tools. They truly so. don't. And it was really important 
important to me to reach places like Mississippi or places like Idaho, which has passed two anti-trans legislation during the pandemic, because these are places where queer and trans people exist too. And I think we have this mistaken idea that everyone is in LA or New York but when I grew up in a small town in Texas, I also needed this kind of resource and infrastructure. And so especially coming into Pride, I really wanna remind people, 50 years after Stonewall, we still have a long way to go. And okay. one of those ways is actually supporting our community that's in the Midwest and in the South and in rural areas. Absolutely, no, it's so essential. And I think, you know, the as well as, you know, tools like your book, it's also the, the movement to kind of push a lot of stuff digitally right now and virtually online, I think gives gives a unique access point to those folks that are, that are uh, geographically isolated from those resources as well, which is Absolutely. Really great. If there's one silver lining to these times, it's that, first of all, we can stay at home and watch all the events that we wanted to see <laughs> at like yeah. home and that's amazing. But also it's just making people part of conversations that they never would have had access to. And as an author, I'm thinking a lot about this, you know, like, Oftentimes, I'm not going to be able to do a book tour and say Australia. And I've been getting messages from people from Australia being like, I'm staying up in the middle of the night to watch this. And like, that's so cool to be able to have a global kind of audience in that way. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I agree. There's, there's a few silver linings. And I, I think it's definitely one of them as well, for sure. Um, so where are you at with this, with this incredible goal and project? And how can viewers watching at home support, um, support this donation drive? So thanks to the generous support of so many celebrities that have shown up for me this this past week alone, I did an Instagram Live with Demi Lovato and one with Laverne Cox just yesterday. And people are really showing up, so the campaign's going really well. We have 1,200 books nice. left, which is great. Yeah. We're, we're gonna totally make this by June 9th. I'm not trying to, I'm trying to like, <laughs> Knock wood, but I'm pretty sure we're going to make it. And we have some really great people lined up who are amplifying this, like Jonathan Van Ness and Diane Grieto. So many people are just showing up for this because I think a lot of us want to just have a public display of love and validation for LGBTQ young people. And so if you would like to donate, it's only $12 and that covers the book and the shipping costs because we have to think about those too. Um, <laughs> you can get one from my website. So you just go to, it's my Instagram handle, alokvmenon.com slash store slash ally and then there it is fantastic well our moderators are popping those links in the chats i have already gone onto your website and bought some copies for you wow, and bought a copy so for much. myself you're welcome i really, and I really hope oh, you are so welcome i really hope that folks uh, watching at home will um consider uh, buying a copy of the book 12 dollars is an absolute bargain when and it comes that's the to cover so it can even just be framed <laughs> in your house <laughs> yeah, it's pretty beautiful. I also saw on your Onalook store, there is some beautiful merch on there as well. If you want to continue your support, there's some other gorgeous illustrations. You've and, got and magnets, some... stickers, tote bags, <laughs> t-shirts. We're out here. A lot of us performers are just trying to find creative ways to get through the pandemic. <laughs> absolutely. Well, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely, they look absolutely gorgeous. So I hope folks will be able to do that. We'll plug those links again at the end of the show. Um, now, Alok, you were recently featured in the, the Sam Smith and Demi Lovato um, music video for I'm Ready, their brand new single. And there was sort of a, an all-star cast of non-binary fans and trans women in that, uh, in that video. There's Carice and Shade Diamond, Valentina, so many amazing babes. Uh, tell me a little bit about that project and sort of what it was like working on that and, and kind of why it's so important for us to have that type of representation in mainstream media. Sure. I would say that it's actually one of the most exciting things I've ever worked on in my life. So I'm so thrilled to talk to you about it. There was just this moment on set where I was like, I want to be around this high quality cameras for the rest of my life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was the kind of set where it's like, you just breathe and someone touches up your makeup. Or yeah. it's like the stylist has an assistant who has an assistant who has an assistant who has an assistant. <laughs> and it's like, oh my gosh, everything is just taken care of in that way. And you're looking at you're looking at the video as it's being filmed because they've got these monitors everywhere, so you can go back and see like how did I look in that last take, and just seeing how beautiful the images were. Yeah. I just we all got emotional because I think that we were thinking, you know, these images have never really been created. That so much yeah. of what's happening in this country right now is this kind of locker room homophobia and transphobia where sports and athleticism are just seen as the domain of straight masculine men 
erasing yeah. women athletes and erasing queer and trans athletes. And yeah. unfortunately, a lot of the legislation that's being introduced is also trying to ban trans people and especially trans women and girls from competing in sports like in Idaho. And so I think it's just so timely to have depictions of trans women and trans feminine people being fierce as fuck, feminine as fuck, and athletic as fuck. So those images were so beautiful. And it was just such a such a great day of sisterhood and solidarity because, you know, being on set, if you've done it before, it just takes a long time. So you're just like mm. hanging out for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, which means that we were getting our makeup done for like three hours. So I'm not complaining, but it was just really <laughs> fun to like just hang out with that group of people to get to know people like Gigi better who had never met before. And that was just really neat. And I, I want to see more projects like that where everyone on set is trained around gender pronouns where mm. everyone was actually being sensitive of gender and sexual diversity. Because I've mm. been a part of some, I won't name names, I've been a part of some mainstream media in the past where you can tell they want the optics of queer mm. and trans acceptance, but they're not willing to actually do the work to make sure it's a safe project to actually work on. Yeah. I think sadly it's it's such a common it's such a common experience for for queer folks and trans folks when they're working on those larger productions um the sort of cultural competency of Hollywood in general is just really honestly very poor so yeah no I I've definitely heard heard that as well we were chatting a couple of weeks to Josh Feldman who's a super incredible actor um and he has created an amazing show called uh, This Close and he was talking about sort of accessibility in the film industry as he was creating that uh, show because he is deaf and yeah had a had a similar experience in terms of working on that show being like this beautiful shining gorgeous light and that not necessarily be been the experiences that he had at working elsewhere so but i um, think that's why it's really important to have to have people on all levels of production so we're talking about camera people we're talking about hairstylists we're talking about makeup artists um, and I think that that's one of the things I really have to commend Sam for doing is that Sam is really at every level trying to bring queer and trans people into the room, like in mm. terms of dancers, in terms of talent. And you could just really feel that and that vibe of like, there's so many queer and trans people here. And I think especially when it comes to the trans community, you know, a lot of people forget that one of the worst forms of transphobia that we're seeing is just job place discrimination. So mm -hmm. there's a Supreme Court case right now, but Amy Stevens, who unfortunately just passed away uh, last week, was it? And when Amy Stevens was fired from her job, they didn't say it's because she was trans, they were using yeah. dress code violation, mm -hmm. which is just obnoxious because dress codes are anti-fabulous and we need to be resisting them anyways. <laughs> but there's this way in which so many trans and gender non-conforming people are kicked out of employment and it's like, if you're a creative person, creative industries can be one of the few spaces where we can actually manifest our genders. And so if you're listening to this and you are thinking about ways to help trans and gender non-conforming people during the pandemic, think about economic opportunities and pathways for our community where people can actually live their own truth and present their own identities without people thinking that their workplace competency is somehow compromised by wearing a five inch heel, okay? <laughs> Preach, I love it. <laughs> Now, speaking of fashion choices, you're a fashion icon for, for so many. Your outfits and styling is always on point, and you've done a lot of work with your hashtag degender fashion movement. Uh, I think a lot of folks are consistently looking to you as a model um, to sort of break through the, the gender binary, through like using fashion as your medium. I would selfishly like to know who, who do you look to for fashion inspiration and why? Sure, totally. So for people who might not be familiar with this conversation, hashtag degender fashion is a hashtag that I created to celebrate how especially queer and trans people have been and will continue to challenge fashion gender norms. Because it was built as a kind of reaction to the ways in which whenever a straight cis man like paints his nails, people will be like, revolution. And there's just this way in which femme phobia is so entrenched that when masked cis men even express like a little bit of femininity. People are like, wow, amazing. Meanwhile, trans women, trans feminine people and queer femmes have been playing around with gender fashion norms, literally five ever. And so what I really wanted to do is to create a visual archive of everyday people who are challenging gender fashion norms 
day to day, not just in photo shoots, not just yeah. on like pride campaigns, but every day, because when you're gender nonconforming, I said it once, I'll say it again, every day is pride darling, because mm -hmm. I don't have the luxury to pass as straight or cis. So everywhere I go, I'm bringing queerness with me. And if people are gonna stare at me, why not look glamorous? Give them something <laughs> to look at. And so I think for me, fashion has always been a tool to publicly engage in political conversations that I might not be able to speak about. So growing up as a small town Texan kid, I couldn't actually say the things that I wanted to say because I was afraid. But fashion was where I could speak. And I learned how to use style as a way to disarticulate people's stereotypes about what I should be and to actually say, ha ha, I'm suspending your judgment. This is who I really am. And I still carry that with me today where it's not just about protesting gender fashion or it's about, it's about protesting any rules. I think mm. fashion should have no rules because fashion just like beauty should be individually tailored to you and your experiences. The idea of is this in fashion or not, I, I don't believe in that. I believe in style and style is constantly evolving and it changes. I mean, if I was to look at photos of myself now, if I was like five years old looking at photos of myself now, I would, I would be scandalized, but I've gotten it together. And so where I get my fashion inspiration from, I mean, I have to be honest, cartoon characters are a big motivating force for me. And I think <laughs> cosplay is one of the most important fashion moments like forever. Like I just love people who, who sincerely dress up for things because mm -hmm. the minute you realize costume wear can just be your day-to-day -day life, it just yeah. makes life so much easier. You're like, wow, I can just, <laughs> I can literally just wear bunny ears today, whatever. You know, it's just like, yeah. there's less of this, sincerity like I'm just saying fascist anti-sincerity it's just about panache and, and camp and then so I, I think cartoon characters are really important to me and then I think I follow a lot of incredible fashionistas online so some people that I'm going to shout out are UK fashion blogger Jamie Windhurst who's a non-binary amazing amazing makeup amazing looks like always giving looks um, my friend Umlilo um, Lilo is a gender fluid South African performance artist and musician from Johannesburg. And the fashion scene in Johannesburg is just next level. Like truly some of the most innovative fashion I've ever seen in my life. And then I'll also give a shout out to Fatima Jamal, um, who's an incredible, uh, fat fam is their handle on Instagram, incredible mm -hmm. black trans woman, fashion icon, who recently modeled for Telfar and then was also at Random Identities. And I just love to see this kind of, I mean, pandemic willing, there was this huge momentum in the past year of a lot of queer and trans designers and queer and trans models really bringing gender neutrality and gender freedom to the forefront. So brands like Chromat, which had an incredible um, winter show that I was a part of where we literally were working out. It was a lot, but we were literally working out to show once again, trans and queer athleticism. So there's so, such cool visual projects that are happening right now. And I really wanna sort of remind people that yes, debating with text and ideas are obviously important. Buy my book, Beyond the Gender Binary, donate to an ally. But <laughs> also visual culture is also political because the truth is we need to shift a paradigm which sees visual queerness as failure to visual queerness as beauty. And we are so far to come from that because people literally look at me all the time and say, why would, I, why would anyone want to look like that? And we need to change it to be like, why doesn't everyone want to look like that? You know, we need to actually be able to say, you have beard and a lipstick, sign me up. Like you want to have chest hair as your accessories. That's amazing. Like you can be able to determine what beauty means to you and straight white norms shouldn't get to say what's beautiful. Amen. Absolutely. Now, speaking of what people have to say, you're, you're a beautiful shining light for representation for so many gender fluid, non-binary and trans folks. What advice um, would you give to young, fabulous people out there that, that meet some of that criticism about the way they dress or present themselves? Like, what do you think is the best kind of message or a piece of advice for those folks? Totally. So I think it's really, I, I'm, I'm going to sort of pivot here and get really serious, but we're in really difficult times right now. And mm. especially the case for a lot of younger trans and queer people who don't have access to community support right now and might be in home situations that are invalidating of their gender, of their sexuality, of their names, of their pronouns, and might not even be able to wear what they want to wear 
And that devastates me. And I've been thinking a lot about like, what do we say to each other in times as bleak as this, that that is like honest. And what I really want to say is when you're feeling lonely, remember that you're part of an ancestral legacy. And what that means is there have always been people who felt that very thing that you're feeling. And there's a way in which we don't have to be lonely in the feeling. We might be lonely in our physical proximity to one another, but know that that fear, that pain, that loss, that harassment, that invalidation is a sentiment that's been there for hundreds of years. And know that there are people who are watching over us. And that's really important. I want to say this to especially to our young trans kids out there is like family that we're born into is a suggestion that actually we are part of an incredible family that we are, we have trans foremothers who literally fought like hell for us and believe in us and are rooting and rooting for us. Sylvia Rivera was thrown into prison for the first time when she was 12 years old. And they created a law called female impersonation from the shoulders up because she was wearing makeup and they couldn't allow that. So they threw her in jail for it. And Sylvia Rivera went right back out of that jail and continued to wear makeup. And that's the legacy that we come from is that every time they try to extinguish us, disappear us, erase us, we find creative and dynamic ways to continue to femifest ourselves. And maybe that might not look like right now, or maybe that might not even be what you're able to do in your town or your city or wherever you are right now. But know that one day there will come a day where the street will be your runway and you're going to have an adoring audience of people who actually celebrates you for you. Yeah, I think that's a absolutely beautiful sentiment to share. Um, now we're gonna ta- we're gonna take some questions from the chat. Uh, so uh, my first question comes from non-binary finery. Alok, what makes you feel euphoric in your gender? <laughs> so many things. Oh my goodness, <laughs> um, it just oozes out of me. Um, okay, so I am an avid selfie taker. And I'm not even going to say sorry because I'm blessing the world. Honestly, Kim Kardashian, call me because (laughs) I need a book of selfies. Not you. Thank you. And I love taking a good selfie. When I look at myself and I'm like, I got the lighting. I got the angle. I got the beard. I got the built-in contour beard. I got the makeup down. I just look at myself and I just feel so proud. Like, I feel like I want to cheer myself on to be like, I have wanted to look like this my entire life and I did it. It feels like an accomplishment. And that's why I say we are leaving visual evidence when we are taking selfies as queer and trans people and especially queer and trans people of color. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when we will be erased. And so I'm trying to create a visual archive to say, they can, they can try to erase my contributions, they can erase my books, they can take that all away, but there's gonna be some bitch out there who remembers my selfie. And at the end of the world, it's gonna be like in 2017, this girl invented the mirror angle. (laughs) I love it. I think that's a fantastic legacy to leave with the world. (laughs) Okay, our next question comes from Queer Skate Alliance. How do you remind folks to be conscious of being too binary in perspective when doing work outside the queer community or along other intersections? Okay, great question. And I think I really appreciate that intervention of saying binary perspective, because one of the things I really try to advance in my book, Beyond the Gender Binary, donate a copy to an LGBTQ young person on my website, is um, (laughs) I actually feel like it is possible to be, to identify as a man or a woman and still challenge the gender binary. People think that if you identify as a man or a woman, you're somehow complicit with the binary. And that's not true. Being complicit with the binary is believing that there's only two genders and those two genders are oppositional. So actually man and woman are two of an infinite array of genders. I like to describe it as two stars in the universe. And so actually you can be a man or woman and just support other people who are not men or women and you're not actually doing the gender binary. And the way that you define your manhood and womanhood is not by saying I'm not that, but rather this is what I am. And I think that move is really important because straight culture teaches us femininity is not masculinity. Masculinity is not femininity. And they're in this kind of antagonism. Whenever as queer folks, we should know femininity and masculinity can actually exist in harmony and even outside of that. 
So there's ways to declare your masculinity or femininity that don't have to rehash this oppositionality. What this looks like at a legislative level is something I really wanna to get to next. A lot of times when we speak about non-binary, gender fluid, gender non-conforming people, we're fixated mostly on aesthetics and we're fixated on language, but we're not fixated on policy. And we have a long way to go around policy because right now, there's legal protections on the basis of sex, sometimes gender, but what happens if your gender changes every five minutes? What happens if one day I'm perceived as this, the next day I'm perceived as this? We don't have a way to legislate around fluid identities. Mm. Two, we still continue to maintain the idea that gender is a useful framework with which the population should divide people. So on identity documents, the conversation has become about changing your gender from male to female. Obviously that's important, but why are we not saying, why do we have to have gender on our identity yeah. documents to begin with anyways? Absolutely. Whose interest does that serve? And so I think we still have a long way to go to actually say, can we create a world where people can truly self-determine their genders? And what self-determination of gender looks like is, I should not have to put male or female on my identity documents. Mm -hmm. What self-determination of my gender looks like is I should not have to have a medical note in order to authenticate what I say that I am. So mm -hmm. I think for me, when we truly fight for gender self-determination, we're already challenging the binary, but we have somehow said it's okay to fight for gender self-determination as long as we make it binary. And that's not enough. We have to fight for gender self-determination and make it so that you can define who you are, not anyone else. Yeah, fighting for those binaries or a larger inclusive sort of spectrum of binaries just feels like we're creating something that'll be outdated before we even achieve it almost, totally. you know? Um, okay, our, our, one of our next questions is from Lukey Boy, uh, who has said, what is their, your go-to response to people who comment about your representation appearance? I panic and I'm usually silent and feel uneasy. Uh, about going outside and what I want to wear. So how do you how do you kind of react to those situations? <laughs> I mean, there's so many different kinds of situations. Yeah. It's wild. It's like, I like to say that existing as a gender fluid person for me is like being in a video game because it's just like, I never know what, what level I'm at, like what's going to be thrown at me. Is someone going to throw a freaking banana peel at me today? Come on. And, <laughs> and so I just have to be prepared for the full spontaneity of the universe. I mean, I sometimes have people come up to me and literally say, can I ask you a question? And I'm like, yes. And they're like, um, why are you wearing a skirt? They're like genuinely baffled. And oh. then there are days where it's like, actually, oh no, this person's very angry and could do something mm. to me. So I need to get out of there. So what I've developed is kind of like a spidey sense of being mm. like, is this person actually like genuinely curious or is this <laughs> going to be a violent interaction? Mm. And then I'm not going to actually engage people who are going to be violent with me and don't even feel like you have to. A lot of cis people make you feel like they are entitled to mm -hmm. your entire like syllabus and they're entitled to like your entire life trajectory. Like, no, you're just literally trying to get some almond milk. Okay. Like move on. So you're allowed to be like, ignore people and to be like, Hey, I'm not interested in answering that or that's not respectful and just move on. People might say that you're a bitch and so be it. It's okay. It's okay to be a bitch. In fact, sometimes it's wonderful to be a bitch. But then if there's someone who is genuinely curious and you have capacity and energy, it could be a really amazing learning opportunity. And I always try to remind myself that because I default into the negative, like, oh my God, people are out here to get me. But I've mm -hmm. actually had some really awesome and remarkable experiences where people have been like, I've never seen anyone who looks like you. That's amazing. Or do you have an Instagram? I want to follow you. That's really cool. Or, oh yeah. my God, my friend is Jennifer, Flute, which is kind of annoying because it's like, I don't need to hear that. But like, it's still kind of sweet, you know, because you're so used to harassment. Anything nice is really sweet. So I guess it's really about just like, listen to your intuition to be like, what are the motivations of the person behind? And if it's a negative motivation, see what your capacity is to deal with a trigger. There's some days that I'm ready to fight. And there's some days that I'm just going to be out there being like, I'm a non-binary person. I don't believe to your Western colonial gender binaries. Here's six books that you need, you know, and I really go in. <laughs> and then there are other days where I'm like, I just don't have the capacity. And, and there's no yeah. one way. It's about you and your capacity. And you shouldn't feel like you're somehow less activist or less political or less like righteous if you concede every once in a while. Because if I was to fight every single battle at every single moment and be that principled, I would have no energy left for myself. Absolutely. And no energy to bring us incredible literature like the beautiful Hello. books that you've just written. 
All right. Well, look, June 6 is approaching and you're feeling confident about your campaign to raise all those books. Um, what is next on your agenda? What's what's next for you? Um, I love that in this conversation, we're basically just doing emotional roller coaster. We're like one minute, it's funny and charming. And the next minute I'm like, now cry with me. I mean, I think um, that's an accurate reflection of real life right now. And that's for also everyone. an accurate re reflection of non-binary. Happiness and sadness are not opposites. They're mutually informing and <laughs> co constitutive yeah. And sometimes laughing tears turn into crying tears and vice versa. Okay, yeah. transition. <laughs> um, so here's the thing. I'm working on a new collection of poems that is the hardest collection I've ever written in my life because it's about death, dying, and grieving. I lost my wow. grandfather who's very close to me in February, oh. not of COVID, but prior to that. Sorry. And for me, it was a really transformative experience because I was with him for the past six months before he died. And so I watched his condition get worse and worse and worse, him get weaker and weaker and weaker. I saw mortality. I saw what happens to unprocessed trauma. I saw elders I saw kinship and it just brought up so much in me that I was like I want to create I mean I'm always thinking about creating manuals which is why this first book is like a manual <laughs> I want to create a manual for grief not that yeah. says here is how you grieve but rather that says it is okay to grieve and grief can look like this because yeah. I keep on thinking you know the, the death count now is up to 100,000. And it's like, we're clapping outside for our essential workers, but we're not crying for the people who are dying. And, mm -hmm. and what happens when we delay grief is that that delayed grief can actually turn into violence. And, yeah. and I really find that we perpetuate cycles of violence because we don't actually do the grief work and we don't actually do the trauma work. And as an artist, what I really wanna do is to create material that people can actually Ocean Vuong writes, one of my favorite uh, writers you should definitely have on the show, amazing, amazing queer Vietnamese writer. He says he wants to embody the literal example of the fire escape. And the fire escape living in New York City is where you go outside to have a smoke. If you smoke, if you don't, you don't have to. And to have a real courageous conversation about a vulnerable thing that you wouldn't say indoors. And he mm -hmm. says, what would happen if we view literature as a fire escape, as a place that we can go to in reality to feel the things that we might not be able to talk to people about. And I want this book to be a place where people who are grieving and not just death, but grieving anything can just freaking cry and be allowed to cry. And, and, and one of the poems I have in the book is, is actually a poem I wrote about my grandfather dying. And I talk about a scene where I would go and I would read him his, his old stories. He was a novelist and a story writer and I would read him his stories and I could tell that he um, couldn't understand what I was saying. Like he was too far gone, but he was yeah. so happy that I was the one saying it because he could perceive that it was my voice. And yeah. so I would cry while reading and he wouldn't notice that I was crying. And I realized that that was the purpose of reading aloud is to cry. And so I wanted that kind of sentiment to be there in this collection, to be like, this collection is meant to be read out loud and to cry while reading. Yeah. And to recognize that crying while reading is actually one of the most beautiful ways to experience the world. Well, I am excited for you to finish that project. That sounds incredible. And again, very timely considering what so many folks are going through. Um, Alok, that is all we have time for tonight. Thank you so much for coming and speaking to us. Uh, our moderators are going to pop those links to donate a book for your campaign in the chat again. But thank you so much for sharing with us and teaching us and being such a beautiful, beautiful representation for our community. Thanks so much for having me. And I hope that I can connect with everyone in person soon. Uh, me too. Take care. Bye. Oh, oh. So fabulous. What a wonderful human and doing such fantastic work out there. Um, please do take the time to click on the links uh, from the chat and donate a copy. It's only $12 to purchase a copy and support um, Alok's project and send a copy of his of the fa their fabulous book to uh, somebody out who needs it far, far away. Now, um, of course, we are coming close to the end of the program. We have the fabulous Megan Graham with you coming up next with two fruity cocktails uh, for you to enjoy, not one, but two. Uh, let's give it up for Megan Graham and cheers to you. Hello everyone, welcome back. My name is Megan Graham. I'm the beverage director for the Los Angeles LGBT Center. 
and I've got a couple fun little drinks for you today. Since this might be our last show, we'll see what happens. I thought I'd get a little bit uh, glitzied up for you and wear all my jewels and whatnot and do two different things for you. So I was thinking about summertime and you know being able to enjoy a drink on your own, of course, but also maybe being able to have a little social distance backyard hangout with some friends. So I have two things that you can make for one or for many and really showcasing a lot of the fruits that we have available and uh, having a little bit of fun. So, and both of them match my outfit, so I'm pretty excited about that, I gotta be honest. The first one is a rosé sangria. So I have a French rosé in here and I added pink apples, green apples, um, some cherries, blood orange, these peaches. I had a little corn trade with a friend of mine. Look at these tiny little baby peaches. They're so cute and so delicious. So I used them in both of these drinks. And so this, I let it sit for a little while and I'm gonna pour it into my pretty little wine glass here over some fresh ice. And what I like to do is I like to have some fresh fruit available to put in that um, poured drink because otherwise it can get a little bit soft and um, you know that crunch of an apple is really good when you're drinking this. I'm gonna top it off with a little bit of sparkling wine and of course that fresh fruit that I was just mentioning. Now you can certainly just plop it in there, but you know I like to throw a garnish in. So we've got this beautiful, beautiful, like I said, totally matches the outfit drink. Uh, if you want to pump it up another notch, you can throw some brandy in here. I might put in my pineapple uh, vodka that I made last week. Um, and if you don't want any alcohol, I actually played around with this alcohol removed wine. This is a red one. They have it white, rosé, red, whatever you're into. This one was kind of jammy and fruit forward, so I did a little citrus and um, berries and stuff to kind of cut that jamminess a little bit and it was it was great It was really a nice alternative to having an alcoholic drink and again, you can batch this so with your with your um, Sangrias, excuse me. You can do white wine red wine rosé play around with whatever fruit you have citrus You can throw herbs in there with the red. I would do maybe um, Rosemary or thyme or basil with the um, more fruity light ones and maybe some mint if you like that. Really a great, great option. Lovely, refreshing. You can have it ready to spill out of your glass at any moment. Oh, so good. The other one I did, really, really fun cocktail. <coughs> Excuse me, that wine just got me a little bit. Uh, it's called a bloomer dropper. And yes, yes, I am wearing bloomers under this dress and no, I am not going to prove it, at least right now anyway. So for your bloomer dropper, it is a vodka based cocktail. Of course I'm using Tito's and I've got some lemonade. I made some fresh, you can use it pre-made of course. And I've got some more of those beautiful little peaches, quick way to peel a peach, throw it in some boiling water and then immediately uh, for like a minute if that, and then throw it into an ice bath and the skin will peel right off, makes it so much easier. So I've got those, it's a blended drink. I blended it beforehand because we learned last time that it gets a little too loud <laughs> to do it on camera. So um, I did that with a little bit of ice and you're gonna do about two ounces of each of vodka, the fresh peaches and the lemonade and then like maybe half a cup of ice or something. If you don't have fresh peaches, you can use canned or you can use nectar totally works. Um, if you can get your hand on fresh, do it. You will love it. So we've got this gorgeous, beautiful, slushy, refreshing, pretty, pretty drink. Um, of course, I've got my tiny little peach garnish. Um, and this is just so good. So good. Mm, I love it. Um, speaking of loving things, I have had so much fun doing this segment. It's been such a great time that I'm going to continue it. Uh, I started an Instagram and a Facebook page, and it's called Cheers to You with Megan. So if you've been having fun and enjoying these videos, please follow me. I'm going to be doing stuff like this, stuff that's easy to do at home, fun, and um, 
you know, why not? So I would love for you to follow me again. Cheers to you with Megan, M-E-G-A-N. And um, if you're making these drinks, definitely tag the Los Angeles LGBT Center. We've had so much fun doing this. We love seeing you every week. I hope to see you again soon. And don't forget that hashtag today and every day. Hashtag cheers to you. I'll see you soon. Mm. So peachy. Ah, delicious. Somebody send me some fresh peaches. It looks good. Thank you, Megan. And a huge thank you to all of our incredible guests tonight on the show. Anthony from The Boy Who Cried Flowers. Of course, the forever fabulous Alok. What a fantastic conversation. Um, a big thanks to Caden and Michael from Little Brawl Productions for putting together those beautiful little queer love stories. Now that is it for Sentertainment. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. It has been absolutely my pleasure to be here every week and bring you this show full of all kinds of fabulous queer joy. Uh, my name's Tui Lyon. My producer is Joe Coleman. And thank you, Joe, and everybody at the center. Big thanks to Sam, our moderator, and everybody that has supported the production of Sentertainment over the last couple of months. It has been an absolute treat to bring you this broadcast. If you haven't already, please donate to the center. The information's on the bottom of your screen and support uh, queer initiatives such as this. Uh, we love you, I care for you, my beautiful queer fam, and I hope you are well, warm and safe wherever you are. Good night. Join Generation Forward for our next CareFun Community Coffee Hour. On May 30th at 11 a.m. Pacific, special guest Lil Miss Hot Mess will be hosting a Drag Queen Story Hour, featuring her new book, The Hips on the Drag Queen Go Swish, Swish, Swish. RSVP at lalgbtcenter.org slash drag story hour.